morning and welcome to all. Uh, just for announcements today, uh, just remember there's a special congregational meeting on Sunday, February 5th. Uh, think about how we can do regarding growth, growth of the church, so uh, please send your ideas to Pastor Dave. Anybody have anything else this morning? All right, we gather in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship as we listen and pray to you. everyone here. I hope you're all here to worship God today. That should be our, our main goal. And actually, not just here, but tomorrow, and the next day, and the day after that, to worship God. That means to put Him first in every area of our life. All you need to do is pick up the Bible and any New, God, New Testament passage, any book, it's going to promote this idea that we put Jesus Christ first in our lives. And I want you to ask yourself something today during the lesson. Do you do that? And if you do, how often do you do that? Because if we really want to be honest, if we really want to be self-searching, we often fall short. And this isn't a critical pulpit I'm preaching from. This is the truth of God's word. We want to do some inward reflection and then hopefully we'll live it out in our lives and worship God in spirit and in truth 24-7, seven, seven days a week. That's the goal. It should be your goal. It is mine today. Will you join me in a word of prayer to God before we get started? Almighty God, thank you for your word Thank you for your written word, but thank you for your living word, Jesus Christ, who came into this world 
not only to save, not only to change lives, but to change us forever, to change our destiny. Help us to see that today and seize on the destiny you've chosen for us. We pray in Jesus' name.
homosexuality and codified in the law as a good thing, whereas we know the Bible talks of such things as evil. We pray, Lord, that you forgive us for our sins, for our country's leaders for their sins, and help us all, Lord, that don't see you, to turn around and turn to your light and live. Lord, we pray for those in our prayer list and those we mention aloud now. Lord, your mercy. Dear God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the freedom that we can come here to worship. As people in other countries have to be in secret to, to worship you. We just continue to be with them in their struggles. And, and be with us as, as we gather together each and every Sunday. Bless us and keep us uh, to look forward to you each and every day. We pray too, probably, for those who are suffering, especially from the disasters in, in this country and, and around the world, especially the, from the tornadoes in the south and the floods and on the west coast, just continue to be with those people, those who've lost homes and, and family members, just continue to be with them as, as they recover from their struggles. Just ask that you would watch over us each and every day as we, as we struggle to work with you and we struggle to do the things we need to do. Just, just help us each day to look to you for guidance, and as, as we do that, that we might be able to witness to you by what we do and say. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Almighty God, you sent your Son to proclaim your kingdom and to teach with authority. Anoint us with the power of your Spirit that we too may bring good news to the afflicted, bind up the brokenhearted, and proclaim liberty to the captive through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Men rejoice when dividing the plunder. 
For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke of that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please read responsibly with me Psalm 27, verses 1 through 14. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, but even then will I be confident. One thing I ask the Lord, this is what I must seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord, and to see him in his temple. For in the day of trouble he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle, and set me high upon a rock. Then I will be all the to me and answer me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, O God my Savior. Teach me your way, O Lord. Lead me in a straight path because of my oppressors. I am so confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart. And wait for the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is taken from the book of Romans, the sixth chapter, verses 11 through 23. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body, so that you obey its evil desires. Do not offer the parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from dead to life and offer the parts of your body to him as instruments of righteousness. For sin shall not be your master, because you are not under the law, but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey him as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, whether you are slaves to sin, which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you wholeheartedly obeyed the form of teaching to which you were entrusted. You have been set free from sin and have become slaves to righteousness. I put this in human terms because you are weak in your natural selves, just as you used to offer the parts of your body in slavery to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness. So now offer them in slavery to righteousness, leading to holiness. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves to God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thank you, God.
chapter 4, verses 12 through 25. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus heard that John had been put in prison, he returned to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived at Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali, to fulfill which was said through the prophet Isaiah, land of Zebulun, land of Naphtali, the way of the sea along the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light. Of those living in the land of the shadow of death, the light has dawned. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers. Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his, older, his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them. Excuse me, I lost my place here. Jesus went through, throughout Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him spread over all Syria, and the people brought to him all that were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, and the paralyzed. He healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the, cap the capitalists, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region across the Jordan followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. kids ever think about something that is so beyond belief that comes to pass and it's like, wait a minute, I don't know if I believe that, but you see the evidence right in front of you. You ever have that happen? Yes. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. Well, they call that a paradox. Do you know what a paradox is? It's exactly what I just described. Something occurs that seems so beyond human belief, it doesn't seem to add up, it seems impossible, but at the end of the day, you know what? It brings out to be true. You know, the Bible's riddled with stories like that. You ever think about it? Now, it's not fantasy. You ever read fantasy, you go to Disney, or pick up a fairy tale book. You know, kissing the, the toad, the comes the frog, or whatever, it comes the prince, how's that work? That's fantasy. But the Bible has real stories in it. And some of them, it's sort of hard to believe, right? How about when they, the armies walked, marched around Jericho? How many times did they march around that city? Seven. Seven. Six, for six days, and now seven, seven times. It was a huge city. And they marched around it for seven days. And eventually, on the seventh day, they blew the trumpet, and what happened? Now, is there any reason? Can you explain how that happened? That's right. But can you explain it in detail how it happened? Your answer was good enough. Not a power of God. There's a story in Luke where Jesus is going and he's preaching in his house. I don't know if it's his house among his disciples, but it's crowded. And Mary and his mother came and his brothers with him. And and sought him that he would come out and talk to him. But he was busy. And he said, this is my family, the ones who hear the word of God and practice it. At that same house, they brought a man. And they brought him, his friends brought him on a cot, and they carried him up and went over the, the roof of the house, climbed up to the roof of the house, dug up the roof, and dropped Jesus in front, or dropped their friend in front of Jesus. That sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? What? My mom's Your mom's pregnant. That's incredible, too. <laughs> That's an incredible thing. And it is, isn't it? But they dropped his friend right in front of Jesus. And Jesus, it says, saw their faith. You know what he said? Your sins are forgiven. So you're scrippled. Why didn't he heal them? Well, the Pharisees, they were thinking in the human sense, and Jesus said, just so you know, I have the power to forgive sins on earth. He said, take up your bed and walk. The guy picked up his bed and he walked. And he left very happy, very joyous. And at the last verse, it says this. And the people were amazed in our language, but they saw a paradox today. Something they couldn't explain. Something they couldn't explain. So listen when you're reading the Bible, listening to stories about Scripture. Listen, listen for the stuff you can't explain and God will explain it to you. I liked your answer. God did it. I don't know how he did it, right? But he did it, right? Are you okay? What's wrong with I don't understand you, honey. Here, you want a piece of candy? Yeah, that's what you want. There you go. Thank you. You okay? You okay? I don't know what she said, but it had my heart. Everyone finds their way back. <laughs> the next couple weeks, I want to be sharing from my heart and hopefully from yours. We say we believe the Word of God, we believe what He has to say, and we don't live that way. And I'm not saying you're not a believer, I'm just saying if you're a child of God, you will believe the unbelievable. There's just no doubt about it. 
Now, that's not without rhyme or reason. I'm, I'm talking about in relations to God. We started off, the first song was, Once I was blind, but now I can see. Hopefully we'll turn off some blindness here today. And some deafness, hopefully you'll hear some things you've never heard before. Because we think in the here and now, and often the Bible speaks in the hereafter. We speak in the temporal, the Bible speaks of the eternal. We have to start looking at the word of God for how it was written to us, how it was intended. Not how we want it to be, how God said it is. And we're using Romans 6 through 8 to try to get some of those points across. <clears throat> but there's a truth out there, and it's out there, and it's sometimes beyond our reach. It seems like we can't get a hold of it, but it's right in front of our eyes. God wants you to see it today. In Romans 6 last week, we talked about before Christ we were dead in our trespasses and sins. Well, even after we are come to Christ, most of us think with our dead minds. You know that? We do. We don't engage the mind Christ gave us. 1 Corinthians 2.16 says you have the mind of Christ. It says in Romans 6, and it says in Romans 6, 4, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. We come to Christ, we should walk brand new. And the word walk is used for, on a personal level. It's not talking about others. This is your personal walk. It's used several times in Scripture. But everything should be new. And we shouldn't be thinking our old ways. The word walk is used several times, Romans 8, 1, 8, 4. Those who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Romans 13, 13 through 14, who walk honestly as Christ did. 1 John 2, 6, we ought to walk as he walked. 1 Thessalonians 2, 12 and 13, walk worthy of God. And those who walk worthy hear his word, believe it, and put it to practice. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith, not by sight. Here's my point. Most times we're understanding scripture in a human sense. Well, there's a need for that. But let's try to hear what God has to say in a divine sense. If you're a child of God, you're born of God, his nature is in you, that's divine. And I'm not talking about make, making things up what the Word of God actually teaches. It's a wonderful thing to have faith in God, come to church, put your trust, but you know how it all works. I don't, but I tell you what, I want to understand more and more as time gets by. So we set about walking, and we were dead in our trespasses and sin. It says in John 5, 24, Truly, truly, Jesus said, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me has everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto what? Life. Truly, I say unto you, the hour is coming, and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and those that hear will what? Will live. I'm going to give you an example, and I'm going to go over a couple of scriptures here, not making any major points, but you could still be acting and thinking as a deadhead, even if you have faith in Jesus Christ, because you refuse to hear his enlightened word. I'm asking you to listen today to what God has to say. But let's say two men came to church here, one sat on this side, one sat on that side, week after week after week. The one on this side, he showed a lot of promise. He was faithful. 
Week after week after week, he was here. And Sunday school class, he was here. Church, he was here. He didn't have a whole lot to say. And when the altar call came, and people would be crying, and he never came up. So most people thought, well, he's good. He's good with God. One on the other side, he struggled. He struggled. He went week after week, but during that time span, he missed a couple times. He missed church a couple times, and then when they'd have an altar call, he'd come up and he'd weep. He'd weep over the sea. Well, the general consensus of the people in the congregation was, this guy's good, and this guy is not. And most times, in God's eyes, it's the other way around. The man over here who's seeking God, seeking change from God, weeps over his sin, doesn't try to pretend and put on airs like this guy here did. This guy here, God, he has God's ear. Remember John 7, 24, Jesus said, don't judge outward appearance. Judge what is right. Now, if you wouldn't know those things, you wouldn't judge, I hope. But let's try to judge what God says is right. Ephesians 2, 1 says, when Christ came, we were dead in our trespasses and sin. Some of us have come to life, but we're not living it. We're still thinking with our dead heads. Verse 5 says, we were dead in our trespasses, and Christ came, and he brought us back to life again through the resurrection of his son. So, you know, just preaching the same old message, just hearing the same old thing, and, and, and just coming to church once a week, is that all you're doing? come to life in Christ. Romans 6 says this. <clears throat> I'm going to start in verse 11. Likewise, reckon you also selves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should disobey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield your members as instruments of righteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. What shall we say? What then shall we say? We sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourself servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, if you're a child of God today, you've been made free from sin, you became servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members, servants of uncleanness, and do iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when you were the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. What fruit have you, though, the things that you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, being made free from sin, become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness, and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. I used to hear that verse a lot, and it stuck with me, but I never really heard it explained, and I'm not going to go into any kind of great explanation here today. But we really need to think about what God's saying. You know that? We need to, to hear it, and we need to meditate on it, gnaw on it, and consider it, and live it out. You know, we're not under the law, but under grace, verse 14. And you know what grace produces? Righteous behavior. Someone who receives grace from God 
and, and they receive the gift of grace, Romans 5, 17, 21, guess what their life's going to show? Righteous behavior. Every time. Romans 10. It's very clear in Scripture. <clears throat> you know, I got this new Bible, and the, the pages, the Scriptures are up and down. It really throws me off. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. How many ever heard that verse quoted? And people stop there. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness. See, righteousness is the key. And with the mouth confession is made to salvation. It's part of it. Righteousness comes from God's grace. So if you perceive God's grace, your life will exhibit righteousness. The point of forgiveness in Scripture is to fellowship with God. That's the point of it. And the point of grace is for us to live righteously. That's what the whole chapter is about. And if we're going to live right, we have to listen right. It says don't let uh, sin reign in your mortal body. How do we do that? By accepting Christ. By yielding ourselves to Christ. Look at verse 13. Neither yield your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto who? God. As those that are alive from the dead. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So, our body parts that commit these sinful acts, our hands, our feet, our mind, that's the body parts, the members. Verse 19 says the same thing. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh, for as you have yielded your members' servants to uncleanness and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members' servants to righteousness unto holiness. I was teaching the Sunday school class where in this wrong way of thinking, my children believe, my grandchildren believe, this person believed, and if you don't catch them in church, quit fooling yourselves. Pray for them. They need Jesus. They need Christ in their life. Me and my wife have discussions about our family members. I pray that they come to Christ, the ones who, who don't know him. Oh, they, they know him, and they might even say they know him, but their life exhibits nothing Christ-like. Oh, they, they're nice, they're friendly, they're hardworking. But righteous? We need to think differently than we used to think. We're to yield ourselves, ourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. I don't know about you, but I don't want to be thinking with a dead head. I want my thinking to be connected to Christ. There's an Old Testament passage that goes with this. In Psalm 37, and it's a very famous passage, I'm just going to read a few verses, but I shared with the Sunday school class, a lot of people quote this scripture. I wasn't planning on using this today, but I will because it just seems fitting. Verse 23 says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not order to be cast down, for the Lord, Lord upholds him with his hand. Verse 24, and it's also in Psalm 73, I think 26. They use that in the Footprints poem. Did you see that Footprints poem? And I've done several funerals, and I was asked to read this years ago at a funeral, and I refused. I knew the person, and they knew I knew the person. I said, have someone else read that, because I didn't think it was true. The person we were having the service for had no regards for God. So I did not convey that in my message to the crowd. I said about this good life this person had led, he was a good person. And I presented life and death, scripture, and the need for salvation. But I never mentioned this man's faith because he had none. But I wasn't going to stand up there and suggest by this footprints poem that he's with God. 
He might have been, something might have happened the last minute, I don't know. But I wasn't going to be the one to project such a truth. It says, though he fall, he shall not only be cast down, for the Lord holds him up. They take a verse, and they don't measure the conditions of the verse. And by the way, his grace and mercy is unconditional. It's for everyone, but it's conditioned on your response. There are conditions once you come to Christ. People say, oh, there's no works. No, there are works after you come to Christ, Ephesians 2.10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus under good works. So let's quit fooling ourselves. But it says in Psalm 37, 3, Trust the Lord and do good, so you shall dwell in the land, and truly you shall be fed. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. He's your number one delight. Commit, and it means yield. Turn over your way, your destiny, unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he will bring it to pass. And he shall bring forth your righteousness as the light, and your judgment as the noon day. The only way to live a righteous life is to yield to God. Yield to him. And not just a moment of time, even though we need to in a moment of time. I mean every day. Yield to God. That's what Romans 6, 7, 8 is teaching us. Don't yield to your flesh. And it's not talking about the, the sins of the flesh like drugs, alcohol, prostitution. That's part of it. It's talking about being mad at your neighbor. It's gossiping. It's talking about every little fleshly thing you do. Yield to God. That's what the Word of God teaches. Yield to Him. And then your instruments as servants of righteousness. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. Roll it over to Him and He'll turn your righteousness. It'll shine like the noonday sun. Amen? Think differently. And I have several things written down here where I thought differently in the past. I just want to give you an example or two before leaving. I was in a prison and <clears throat> pastors would come in and they'd meet with the men and uh, privately they'd meet with them in person. This one man kept giving away Bibles. He was addressed, and uh, it was my responsibility to talk to him, so I said to him, sir, you have to stop doing this. I said, you know, you know what you're doing? Oh, no, no. He said, I, I just can't help it. They want a Bible, I'm going to give them one. I said, then we're going to cancel your service. Well, that went over not very well. And at first, when you first hear it, that sounds a little rough, but... This man had been coming in 20 years. I came in there and they asked me to work on these problems they have. And he had been breaking the rules for 20 years. He knew it. See, what they would do is in the old days, they would stick things in the Bibles and drugs. And he knew that's what they did. But he was exceptional. He, was a, he didn't need to honor the rules. So we gave him opportunity, we met with him, we said, listen, if this doesn't stop, you're done in here. Well, we suspended him for a couple of months. Seems a little harsh, doesn't it? But can you imagine all the men that watched this pastor break the rules? Why? Because I can. The wrong way of thinking. Wrong way of thinking. We need to start thinking God's way. Uh, there's examples after examples of this in my life, and I know you can have some of your own. Think about it. when you did something that was right to him who knows to do good and does it not. To him, what is it? Sin. James 4 17. I've lived by that verse. Got me in trouble many times. One time down at Calvary, me and my wife were discipling 
a young couple. It wasn't very promising, but we agreed to it. And they were involved in things they shouldn't have been involved in. I'd say 16 and 18, is that about right? Then we found out through the counseling that the mother who was high up in the church was encouraging the daughter to do things with the boy that she shouldn't be doing. I went to the woman and said, you need to cease and desist. Didn't go over well, she got very hostile. This is an important person in the church. I said, you need to ask your daughter and this boy to cease and desist and not encourage it anymore. Well, I guess she didn't believe me. So my next move was to the pastor, and I, I addressed it. Well, it all hit the fan. <laughs> it, it hit the fan like you wouldn't believe it. And we were getting phone calls at home. How dare you? How dare you do such a thing? God says I must. See, how do you think? By the way, we're friendly with these folks today. They ended up marrying their daughter to some other man. But that's beside the point. For several months, it was rough. Start thinking the way God wants us to think. Not what we're accustomed to. Because you don't know what's going on behind the scenes, do we? And if... You know to do good in a certain situation, scenario, do it. That's what the Word of God teaches. And it has to be lined up with the Word of God. But to him who knows to do good and does it not, to him it is sin. That's one of my favorite, Romans 14, 22 and 23. Don't cause someone to do something you want to do if it's not in their power to do it, but have faith and trust that you're doing the right thing. Because it, without faith, it's impossible to please God. Amen? Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to focus on who you'd have us be. Then focus on what you'd have us do. Help us to focus on who you'd have us be. And then what we should do will follow. Help us to yield our, our person, our whole being to you. And then our body parts as instruments of righteousness. Help us not to focus on the law, but help us to focus on you, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. The affirmation of faith, the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered in the conscious life, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell on the third day. Almighty God in his mercy, kindness, and grace has given his son to die for us. <clears throat>
for his sakes, gives us all our sins. He has called him the ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, by Christ's authority. I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Peace. 